Introduction Market anarchists believe in mutual exchange, not in economic privilege. They believe in free markets, not in capitalism. What makes them anarchists is their belief in a fully free and consensual society, a society in which order is achieved not through legal force or political government, but through free arrangements and voluntary cooperation on a basis of equality. What makes them market anarchists is their recognition of free market exchange as a vital medium for peacefully anarchic social order. But the markets they envision are not like the privilege-riddled markets we see around us today. Markets laboring under government and capitalism are pervaded by persistent poverty, ecological destruction, radical inequalities of wealth, and concentrated power in the hands of corporations, bosses, and landlords. The consensus view is that exploitation, whether of human beings or of nature, is simply the natural result of markets left unleashed. The consensus view holds that private property, competitive pressure, and the profit motive must, whether for good or for ill, inevitably lead to capitalistic wage labor, to the concentration of wealth and social power in the hands of a select class, or to business practices based on growth at all costs, and the devil take the hindmost. Market anarchists dissent. They argue that economic privilege is a real and pervasive social problem, but that the problem is not a problem of private property, competition, or profits, per se. It is not a problem of the market form, but of markets deformed. Deformed by the long shadow of historical injustices and the ongoing continuous exercise of legal privilege on behalf of capital. The market anarchist tradition is radically pro-market and anti-capitalist, reflecting its consistent concern with the deeply political character of corporate power, the dependence of economic elites on the tolerance or active support of the state, the permeable barriers between political and economic elites, and the cultural embeddedness of hierarchies established and maintained by state-perpetrated and state-sanctioned violence. The Market Form this book is intended as an extended introduction to the economic and social theory of left-wing market anarchism. Market anarchism is a radically individualist and anti-capitalist social movement. Like other anarchists, market anarchists are radical advocates of individual liberty and mutual consent in every aspect of social life, thus rejecting all forms of domination and government as invasions against liberty and violations of human dignity. The market anarchists' distinct contribution to anarchist thought is their analysis of the market form as a core component of a thoroughly free and equal society. Their understanding of the revolutionary possibilities inherent in market relationships freed from government and capitalistic privilege, and their insights into the structures of political privilege and control that deform actually existing markets and uphold exploitation in spite of the naturally equilibrating tendencies of market processes. Since they insist on so sharp a distinction between the market form as such and the economic features of actually existing capitalism, it is important to carefully distinguish the key features of markets as market anarchists understand them. The social relationships that market anarchists explicitly defend and hope to free from all forms of government control are relationships based on 1. Ownership of property, especially decentralized individual ownership not only of personal possessions, but also of land, homes, natural resources, tools, and capital goods. 2. Contract and voluntary exchange of goods and services by individuals or groups on the expectation of mutual benefit. 3. Free competition among all buyers and sellers, in price, quality, and all other aspects of exchange, without ex-ante restrictions or burdensome barriers to entry. 4. Entrepreneurial discovery, undertaken not only to compete in existing markets, but also in order to discover and develop new opportunities for economic or social benefit. And five, spontaneous order, recognized as a significant and positive coordinating force in which decentralized negotiations, exchanges, and entrepreneurship converge to produce large-scale coordination without, or beyond the capacity of, any deliberate plans or explicit common blueprints for social or economic development. Market anarchists do not limit ownership to possession or to common or collective ownership, although they do not exclude these kinds of ownership either. They insist on the importance of contract and market exchange and on profit-motivated free competition and entrepreneurship. And they not only tolerate, but celebrate the unplanned, spontaneous coordination that Marxists deride as the social anarchy of production. 
But left-wing market anarchists are also radically anti-capitalist, and they absolutely reject the belief, common to both the anti-market left and the pro-capitalist right, that these five features of the market form must entail a social order of bosses, landlords, centralized corporations, class exploitation, cutthroat business dealings, immiserated workers, structural poverty, or large-scale economic inequality. They insist, instead, on five distinctive claims about markets, freedom, and privilege. The Centrifugal Tendency of Markets Market anarchists see freed markets, under conditions of free competition, as tending to diffuse wealth and dissolve fortunes, with a centrifugal effect on incomes, property titles, land, and access to capital, rather than concentrating it in the hands of a socioeconomic elite. Market anarchists recognize no de jure limits on the extent or kind of wealth that any one person might amass, but they believe that market and social realities will impose much more rigorous de facto pressures against massive inequalities of wealth than any de jure constraint could achieve. The Radical Possibilities of Market Social Activism Market anarchists also see freed markets as a space not only for profit-driven commerce, but also as spaces for social experimentation and hard-driving grassroots activism. They envision market forces as including not only the pursuit of narrowly financial gain or maximizing returns to investors, but also the appeal of solidarity, mutuality, and sustainability. Market processes can and ought to include conscious, coordinated efforts to raise consciousness, change economic behavior, and address issues of economic equality and social justice through nonviolent direct action. The Rejection of Statist Quo Economic Relations Market anarchists sharply distinguish between the defense of the market form and apologetics for actually existing distributions of wealth and class divisions, since these distributions and divisions hardly emerged as the result of unfettered markets, but rather from the governed, regimented, and privilege-ridden markets that exist today. They see actually existing distributions of wealth and class divisions as serious and genuine social problems, but not as problems with the market form itself. These are not market problems, but ownership problems and coordination problems. The Regressiveness of Regulation Market anarchists see coordination problems, problems with an unnatural, destructive, politically imposed interruption of the free operation of exchange and competition as the result of continuous, ongoing legal privilege for incumbent capitalists and other well-entrenched economic interests, imposed at the expense of small-scale competitors in the working class. Dispossession and Rectification Market anarchists see economic privilege as partly the result of serious ownership problems, problems with an unnatural, destructive, politically imposed maldistribution of property titles produced by the history of political dispossession and expropriation inflicted worldwide by means of war, colonialism, segregation, nationalization, and kleptocracy. Markets are not viewed as being maximally free so long as they are darkened by the shadow of mass robbery or the denial of ownership, and they emphasize the importance of reasonable rectification of past injustices, including grassroots, anti-corporate, anti-neoliberal approaches to the privatization of state-controlled resources, processes for restitution to identifiable victims of injustice, and revolutionary expropriation of property fraudulently claimed by the state and state-entitled monopolists. The Market Anarchist Tradition Early anarchist thinkers such as Josiah Warren and Pierre-Joseph Proudhon emphasized the positive, socially harmonizing features of market relationships when they were conducted within the context of equality, with Proudhon, for example, writing that social revolution would abolish the system of laws and principle of authority to replace them with the system of contracts. Footnote. See Organization of Economic Forces, General Idea of the Revolution in the Nineteenth Century, Chapter 3, pages 37 to 58 in this volume. Drawing on Warren's and Perdone's use of contract and exchange for models of social mutuality, distinctive strands of market anarchism have emerged repeatedly within the broad anarchist tradition, punctuated by crises, collapses, interregnums, and resurgences. The history is complex, but it can be roughly divided into three major periods represented in this text. One, a first wave, represented mainly by individualist anarchists and mutualists, such as Benjamin Tucker, Voltairine de Clare, and Dyer Lum, and occupying roughly the period from the American Civil War to 1917. Footnote. 
The exact differences between individualists and mutualists during the first wave were hardly ever cut and dried. Many writers, such as Tucker, used each word at different times to refer to their own position. However, a few differences might be sketched between those who were most frequently called individualists, such as Tucker or Yaros, and those who were most frequently called mutualists, such as Dyer Lum, Clarence Swartz, or the European followers of Proudhon. In particular, that while both supported the emancipation of workers and ensuring that all workers had access to capital, the mutualists tended to emphasize the specific importance of worker-owned cooperatives and direct worker ownership over the means of production, while individualists tended to emphasize that under conditions of equal freedom, workers would settle on whatever arrangements of ownership made most sense under the circumstances. Complicating matters, mutualism is now retrospectively used in the 21st century to refer to most anti-capitalist market anarchists, or specifically to those, like Kevin Carson, who differ from the so-called Lockean position on land ownership, who believe that land ownership can be based only on personal occupancy and use, ruling out absentee landlordship as undesirable and unworthy of legal protection. Mutualists, in this sense of the term, include both those who were most frequently called individualists during the first wave, such as Tucker, and those who were most frequently called mutualists, such as Lum. 2. A second wave, coinciding with the radicalization of formerly pro-capitalist American libertarians and the resurgence of anarchism as a family of social movements during the radicalism of the 1960s and 1970s. And 3. A third wave, developing as a dissident strand within the anarchist milieu of the 1990s and the post-Seattle movement of the new millennium. In spite of discontinuities and differences, each wave has typically revived the literature of the earlier waves and drawn explicitly on its themes. What has in general united them is their defense of market relationships and their particular emphasis on the revolutionary possibilities inherent in the market form, when it is, to the extent that it is, liberated from legal and social institutions of privilege. The anti-capitalism of the first wave individualists was obvious to them and to many of their contemporaries. Benjamin Tucker famously argued that four monopolies, or clusters of state-guaranteed privileges, were responsible for the power of the corporate elite. The patent monopoly, the effective monopoly created by the state's distribution of arbitrarily engrossed land to the politically favored and its protection of unjust land titles, the money and credit monopoly, and the monopolistic privileges conferred by tariffs. The economically powerful depended on these monopolies, eliminate them, and the power of the elite would dissolve. Tucker was committed to the cause of justice for workers in conflict with contemporary capitalists, and he clearly identified with the burgeoning socialist movement. But he argued against Marx and other socialists that market relationships could be fruitful and non-exploitative, provided that the market-distorting privileges conferred by the four monopolies were eliminated. The radicalism of Tucker and his compatriots, and that of the strand of anarchism they birthed, was arguably less apparent after the breaking of the first wave than it was to their contemporaries. Perhaps, in part, this is because of their disputes with representatives of other anarchist tendencies, whose criticisms of their views have influenced the perception of later anarchists. It is also, unavoidably, a consequence of the identification of many of their 20th century descendants with the right wing of the libertarian movement, and thus as apologists for the corporate elite and its social dominance. Though there were honorable exceptions, 20th century market-oriented libertarians frequently lionized corporate titans, ignored or rationalized the abuse of workers, and trivialized or embraced economic and social hierarchy. While many endorsed the critique of the state and of state-secured privilege offered by Tucker and his fellow individualists, they often overlooked or rejected the radical implications of the earlier individualist class-based analysis of structural injustice. There were, in short, few vocal enthusiasts for the individualist brand of anti-capitalism in the early to mid-20th century. The most radical fringe of the market-oriented strand of the libertarian movement, represented by thinkers like Murray Rothbard and Roy Childs, generally embraced not the anti-capitalist economics of individualism and mutualism, but a position its advocates described as anarcho-capitalism. The future free society they envisioned was a market society, but one in which market relationships were little changed from business as usual, and the end of state control was imagined as freeing business to do much what it had been doing before, rather than unleashing competing forms of economic organization, which might radically transform market forms from the bottom up, 
But in the second wave of the 1960s, the family of anarchist social movements, revived by anti-authoritarian and countercultural strands of the new left, and the anti-war radicals among the libertarians began to rediscover and republish the works of the mutualists and the other individualists. Anarcho-capitalists, such as Rothbard and Childs, began to question libertarianism's historical alliance with the right, and to abandon defenses of big business and actually existing capitalism in favor of a more consistent left-wing market anarchism. Perhaps the most visible and dramatic example was Carl Hess's embrace of the new left radicalism and his abandonment of capitalist economics in favor of small-scale, community-based, non-capitalist markets. By 1975, the former Goldwater speechwriter declared, I have lost my faith in capitalism, and I resist this capitalist nation-state, observing that he had turned from the religion of capitalism. Footnote. To be sure, while Hess's social attitudes do not seem to have changed substantially after he made these statements, he became less wedded to the language of anti-capitalism. He published Capitalism for Kids, Growing Up to Be Your Own Boss, in 1986, but there is no reason to doubt that what Hess meant by capitalism here was what contemporary left-wing market anarchists mean when they talk about peaceful, voluntary exchange in a genuinely freed market, rather than what he had rejected in 1975. Certainly, as the book's subtitle suggests, he had no intention of steering young readers into careers as corporate drones. The second wave was followed by a second trough for anarchism broadly and market anarchism in particular. By the later 1970s and the 1980s, the anti-capitalist tendency among market-oriented libertarians had largely dissipated or been shouted down by the mainstreaming pro-capitalist politics of well-funded libertarian institutions like the Cato Institute and the leadership of the Libertarian Party. But with the end of the Cold War, the realignment of long-standing political coalitions, and the public coming out of a third-wave anarchist movement in the 1990s, the intellectual social stages were set for today's resurgence of anti-capitalist market anarchism. By the beginning of the 21st century, anti-capitalist descendants of the individualists had grown in number, influence, and visibility. They shared the early individualists' conviction that markets need not, in principle, be exploitative. At the same time, they elaborated and defended a distinctly libertarian version of class analysis that extended Tucker's list of monopolies and highlighted the intersection of state-secured privilege with systematic past and ongoing dispossession and with a range of issues of ecology, culture, and interpersonal power relations. They emphasized the fact that, while genuinely liberated, freed markets could be empowering, Market transactions that occurred in contexts misshapen by past and ongoing injustice were, not surprisingly, debilitating and oppressive. But the problem, the new individualists, like their predecessors, insisted, lay not with markets but rather with capitalism, with social dominance by economic elites secured by the state. The solution, then, was the abolition of capitalism through the elimination of legal privileges, including the privileges required for the protection of title to stolen and engrossed assets. The new individualists have been equally critical of explicitly statist conservatives and progressives, and of market-oriented libertarians on their right, who use the rhetoric of freedom to legitimize corporate privilege. Their aggressive criticism of this sort of vulgar libertarianism has emphasized that existing economic relationships are shot through with injustice from top to bottom and that calls for freedom can readily be used to mask attempts to preserve the freedom of elites to retain wealth acquired through state-tolerated or state-perpetrated violence and state-guaranteed privilege. The Natural Habitat of the Market Anarchist This book would not have been possible without the Internet. The readers of Markets Not Capitalism will quickly notice that many of the articles do not read quite like chapters in an ordinary book. Many of them are short. Many of them begin in the middle of a dialogue. One of the most frequent opening phrases is, In a recent issue of such-and-such, so-and-so said that. The contemporary articles often originally appeared online as posts to a web blog. They refer frequently to past posts or pre-existing discussions, and often criticize on or elaborate comments made by other authors in other venues. While the articles have been reformatted for print, many still read very distinctly like the blog posts that they once were. But this is not merely an artifact of internet-based social networks. The history of the individualist and mutualist tradition is largely a history of ephemeral publications, short-lived presses, self-published pamphlets, and small radical papers. 
The most famous is certainly Benjamin Tucker's Liberty, 1881 to 1908, but also includes such publications as Hugh Pentecost's 20th Century, 1888 to 1898, as well as second wave market anarchist journals such as Left and Right, 1965 to 1968, and Libertarian Forum, 1969 to 1984. All of these publications were short and published frequently. Their articles were typically critical rather than comprehensive, idiosyncratic rather than technical, in approach and tone. Long-standing, far-reaching debates between papers, correspondence, and the surrounding movement were constant sources of material. Where a specific interlocutor was not available for some of these articles, the author might, as in Declare and Slobodinsky's The Individualist and the Communist, A Dialogue, go so far as to invent one. The most famous book-length work from the first wave, Tucker's Instead of a Book, by a Man Too Busy to Write One, 1893, is simply a collection of short articles from Liberty, the majority of which are clearly themselves replies to questions and arguments posed by Liberty's readers or fellow journal editors. The critical exchanges read very much like those one might encounter today on blogger or WordPress sites, because, of course, today's blog is merely a new technological form taken by the small independent press. The independent dialogue-based small press has provided a natural habitat for market anarchist writing to flourish, whereas liberal and Marxist writing found their most distinctive habitats in declarations, manifestos, and intricate comprehensive treatises. Why this might be the case is a large question, worth exploring far beyond what the limits of this preface might allow. However, it may be worth noting that market anarchism has more or less always emerged as a critical and experimental project on the radical fringes of social movements, whether the Owenite movement, the free thought movement, the labor movement, the American market-oriented libertarian movement, or the counter-globalization movement and the associated social anarchist milieu. Market anarchism aims to draw out social truths, not by dogmatizing or laying down the law, but rather by allowing as far as possible for the free interplay of ideas and social forces, by looking for the unintended consequences of accepted ideas, by engagement in an open-ended process of experimentation and discovery that permits the constant testing of both ideas and institutions against competitors and bottom-line reality. The revolutionary anarchist and mutualist Dyer D. Lum, 1839-1893, wrote in The Economics of Anarchy that a defining feature of market anarchy was the plasticity of social and economic arrangements as opposed to the rigidity of either statist domination or communist economic schemes. The substance of market anarchist ideas has arguably shaped the form in which market anarchist writers feel most at home expressing them, or perhaps conversely, the form of the writing may even be what has often made the substance possible. It may be that market anarchist ideas most naturally take shape in the course of dialogue rather than disquisition, in the act of critical give and take rather than one-sided monologue. The value of spontaneity, exploratory engagement, and the rigors of the competitive test may be as essential to the formation of market anarchist ideas in writing as they are to the implementation of those ideas in the world at large. If so, then these articles must be read with the awareness that they have, to a certain extent, been lifted out of their natural environment. There are longer, sustained treatments of the topics they address, but most articles were originally contributions to long-standing, ongoing projects— and took place in the course of wide-ranging debates, we have collected them in a printed anthology to do a service to the student, the researcher, and anyone else who is curious about alternative approaches in free market economics and anarchist social thought. But they are best understood not as identifying the end of the subject, or even really the beginning, but rather as offering an invitation to dive in, in medias race, to see left-wing market anarchist ideas emerging from the dialogical process itself, and to participate in the ongoing conversation. What's in it? With these articles, we seek to help unearth a tradition of radical dissent that arguably deserves greater attention. But we hope that they will prove to be more than historical interest. Our goal is to offer detailed analyses of key issues related to power and resistance, provide a basis for conversation between individualist anarchists and representatives of other anarchist tendencies, and clearly undermine the self-serving corporatist apologetics and the claim to the libertarian label of defenders of conventionally pro-capitalist, vulgar libertarianism. The book collects essays from the late 19th century to the present, organized into eight parts. Footnote. 
we have sought throughout these essays to standardize reference style and in some cases to correct, expand, or update references. In at least one case, we have also corrected a quotation. Part 1, The Problem of Deformed Markets, introduces the central theme of the text, the political deformation that distorts, obliterates, or perverts the naturally positive and mutual relationships characteristic of markets, and the naturally productive and harmonizing role of market forces, such as competition, trade, and the division of labor, into the alienating, exploitative structure of state capitalism. In The Freed Market, William Gillis shows how a simple change of tense can make all the difference in clarifying the difference between market anarchy and statist capitalism. In State Socialism and Anarchism, Benjamin Tucker explains why a market-oriented variety of anarchism can be understood as part of the socialist tradition, provided the role of privilege in bringing about the evils against which socialists rightly protest is understood. In excerpts taken from his general idea of the revolution in the 19th century, Proudhon argues that competition, division of labor, commerce, contract, and property— Economic forces, which are today forces driving exploitation, alienation, and poverty, can be transfigured by the revolutionary dissolution of political privilege and the replacement of the authoritarian system of laws by the mutual system of contracts. Footnote. In selecting passages from Proudhon's nuanced and immensely challenging work, we must acknowledge, and indeed insist, that we have not presented anything like the whole of Proudhon's social and economic thought, or even the entirety of his thought about economic forces, contracts, and property. Rather, we have attempted to identify and present a particular strand within the tapestry of Proudhon's thought, and in particular to present the strand which was best understood by, and most influential on the work of later market anarchists, such as Benjamin Tucker or Dyer Lum, with such themes as the mutuality of contract, the deformation of markets by privilege, and the transfiguration of property, competition, and exchange in markets liberated from hierarchy. In these passages, Proudhon should, to an extent, be read as Tucker's Proudhon, or the Mutualist's Proudhon. There are other Proudhons to be found, the Communard's Proudhon, Kropotkin's Proudhon, the Syndicalist's Proudhon, and the real thinker himself must be recognized as someone quite as important as, and far more intricate than, any of these. In Markets Freed from Capitalism, Charles Johnson examines the political mechanisms and structures of privilege by which government misshapes markets, constructs state capitalism, and foists fetishized forms of exchange into social spaces where they are not wanted, and examines the importance of envisioning the revolutionary transformation of markets without capitalistic inequalities. Part 2, Identities and Isms, collects careful reflections by individualist anarchists on the desirability, undesirability, and significance of multiple identities, capitalist, socialist, libertarian, individualist, communist. In Armies That Overlap and Socialism, What It Is, Benjamin Tucker argues that the socialist call for worker autonomy and the end of capitalist privilege is not a violation of market principles. It is against privilege that socialists fight, and that need not mean a fight against market exchange. In Advocates of Freed Markets Should Oppose Capitalism and What is Laissez-Faire, Gary Chartier and Sheldon Richman argue that right-wing market-oriented libertarians' romance with capitalism is profoundly mistaken and that the rejection of capitalism is not only compatible with, but indeed required by, support for genuinely freed markets. In Market Anarchism as Stigmergic Socialism and Socialist Ends, Market Means, Brad Spangler and Gary Chartier argue more aggressively that the market-oriented anarchism of the individualists is, as Tucker made clear, not only anti-capitalist, but part of the socialist tradition. In The Individualist and the Communist, and the follow-up essay, A Glance at Communism, Rosa Slobodinsky and Voltairine de Clare explain why two varieties of anarchism can be thought of as pursuing similar goals using different means. The individualist in Slobodinsky and de Clare's imagined dialogue accepts the label capitalist for the sake of argument, but takes a position unequivocally opposed to capitalist privilege. Charles Johnson's Libertarianism Through Thick and Thin explains why a narrowly conceived anti-statism fails to capture the emancipatory potential of libertarianism and lays the groundwork for arguments designed to link opposition to state power with challenges to other forms of hierarchy, as subordination in the workplace and patriarchal gender relations. Part 3, Ownership, 
enters an open debate among market anarchists, individualist anarchists, and mutualists, the nature and justification of property. Individualists and mutualists have a broad, end-of-day agreement on the question of ownership. They view actually existing property titles as shot through with privilege and injustice, but argue in favor of free social arrangements in which decentralized individual ownership, cured of the disease of privilege and political dispossession, will play an important role. But within that broad end-of-day agreement, there is an intense and complicated dialogue over justifications for property as well as the details of how it ought to be recognized and how far it might extend. In this section, we aim to offer a series of unconventional defenses of property rights from some of the major perspectives represented in the debate, unconventional both in their foundations and in their implications for the kinds of property that might characterize markets freed radically from capitalist privilege. In A Plea for Public Property, the individualist anarchist Roderick Long defends a natural rights justification for individual property rights, and shows that, given the arguments he uses to defend such rights, it follows that a fully freed market must include space for the commons and genuinely public property, owned neither by the state nor by private owners, but rather by the unorganized public that enjoys its use. In From Whence Do Property Titles Arise?, the market anarchist William Gillis begins with a sympathetic exploration of anarchist communism and ends with a utilitarian defense of a strong form of private property, derived from considerations of economic calculation. In The Gift Economy of Property, the mutualist Sean Wilbur re-examines Proudhon's approach to property and commerce and asks whether the social anarchist conception of the gift economy and the gift of mutual recognition might not provide a subversive sort of foundation for an economy of ownership and equal exchange, which challenges both conventional natural rights accounts and utilitarian understandings of property. In Fairness and Possession, Gary Chartier offers an alternative market anarchist defense of possessory rights rooted in a natural law approach, shaped by the Golden Rule, and a fundamental appeal to principles of fairness, taken in tandem with a set of truisms about human behavior and the human situation. Finally, in The Libertarian Case Against Intellectual Property Rights, Roderick Long turns to an important question of application challenging capitalists' frequent assertions of ownership over ideas through copyrights and patents. Intellectual property rights, Long argues, are not genuine labor-based property rights, but instead coercive, monopolistic claims on the minds and tangible property of others. Part 4, Corporate Power and Labor Solidarity, brings together articles on big business, bosses, workers, and the extent to which the concentration of economic power and inequality in the labor market depend on large-scale privileges conferred repeatedly and persistently by the state on corporations and capitalists. In Corporations versus the Market, or Whip Conflation Now, Roderick Long lays out the problem of conflation, or vulgar libertarianism, in which patterns of corporate ownership and common business practices propped up by state intervention are confusedly defended as if they were the outcome of free market processes. In Does Competition Mean War? and Economic Calculation in the Corporate Commonwealth, Benjamin Tucker and Kevin Carson each show how market competition and profit motives, typically invoked to try to defend the interests of large corporations, would actually dissolve their fortunes and free markets from their grip in the absence of legal protections for over-centralized business models. Roy Child's Big Business and the Rise of American Statism takes a step back into history, emphasizing that the growth of state power in American history cannot be seen as a counterweight to the growth of corporate power because it has largely been driven by the corporate interests of politically connected robber barons. Thus also, Roderick Long demonstrates in Regulation, the Cause, Not the Cure of the Financial Crisis, that it was not unregulated finance markets, but a long history of unaccountable, government-insulated finance capitalism, which produced the financial and economic collapse of the last half-decade. In Industrial Economics, Labor Struggle in a Free Market, and Should Labor Be Paid or Not, Dyer Lum, Kevin Carson, and Benjamin Tucker consider the foremost alternative to corporate power— not a political solution or a regulatory state, but radical free market labor solidarity, wildcat unionism, and ultimately worker ownership of the means of production. Part 5, Neoliberalism, Privatization, and Redistribution, considers the pseudo-market politics of neoliberal market reforms, and considers how a radical defense of free markets, private property, and the de-statification of the economy 
might call for dramatically different approaches from either state progressivism or corporate liberalization and subsidized capitalist development. In Free Market Reforms and the Reduction of Statism, Kevin Carson underscores the importance of understanding just how particular legal, social, and political structures are interconnected and what the net effect of altering each would be on the dismantling of the state. In Free Trade is Fair Trade, Joe Peacott of the Boston Anarchist Drinking Brigade looks at the radical possibilities of a world truly without economic borders and the political fraud of government-managed, corporate-subsidizing free trade agreements. In Two Words on Privatization, Charles Johnson disentangles two senses of privatization. On one hand, genuine efforts to devolve control of politically confiscated resources from government back to civil society— and on the other, the kind of corporate-driven privatization routinely inflicted on developing countries, which amounts to little more than the outsourcing of government monopolies. Finally, in Where Are the Specifics and Confiscation and the Homestead Principle, Carl Hess and Murray Rothbard look at the radical implications of anarchistic property rights and argue that the emergence of freed markets calls for a radically different model of privatization— worker occupations of many large businesses and institutions, and revolutionary expropriation of the means of production. Part 6, Inequality and Social Safety Nets, asks whether freed markets would sustain large-scale inequalities of wealth, and how, with the abolition of all forms of government, including government welfare, economic crises and poverty might still be addressed through authentically social safety nets, that is, through grassroots mutual aid. Jeremy Whelan's Let the Free Market Eat the Rich begins by discussing economic entropy and the doom of accumulated fortunes in freed markets. He shows how economic relationships genuinely free from privilege can and naturally will tend to undermine the wealth and power consolidated in a capitalist society. Joe Peacott's Individualism and Inequality considers how capitalism depends on economic inequality and how market anarchy would confine or destroy such inequality. He goes on to ask how the end of destructive, systemic inequalities might relate to smaller-scale, more everyday forms of social inequality. Roderick Long's How Governments Solved the Healthcare Crisis and Joe Peacott's The Poverty of the Welfare State discuss ways in which statist welfare programs destroy social power while fostering state power and suggest that the form of social power working people have repeatedly used to gain control over their own health care costs and provide security for each other in hard times grassroots networks of worker-run mutual aid associations, can provide positive alternatives to statist welfare systems in a flourishing free market. Part 7, Barriers to Entry and Fixed Costs of Living, examines how capitalist economic relations have depended on the forced immiseration of the poor and the systematic burning out of alternatives to wage labor and rent. One of the most effective means is to make workers artificially desperate by means of a sort of ratchet effect— simultaneously boosting fixed costs of living and destroying opportunities for making a living outside of the cash-wage economy. The ratchet effect has been exerted by means of government-granted monopolies that drive up the costs of pervasive everyday goods, large-scale land theft and engrossment that bolster rents and deprive workers of opportunities to support themselves on their own terms, and government regulation in the interest of socioeconomic cleansing. In How Intellectual Property Impedes Competition, Kevin Carson looks at the large-scale structural ripple effects of pervasive monopoly rents in the transmission and expression of ideas in culture, medicine, and technology. In English Enclosures and Soviet Collectivization, Joseph R. Stromberg shows how the state, whatever its explicit ideology, can foster what he suggestively identifies as an anti-peasant mode of development. In The American Land Question, Stromberg shows that massive land theft and engrossment have distorted economic relationships in the United States since before the colonial period. In Healthcare as Radical Monopoly, Carson explains in detail how the cost, accessibility, and flexibility of healthcare are profoundly limited by the state's action on behalf of multiple groups on whom it deliberately or inadvertently confers legal privileges. Scratching By by Charles Johnson is a devastating indictment of the regulatory state's role in the creation and perpetuation of poverty. Part 8, Freed Market Regulation, Social Activism and Spontaneous Order, looks at ways in which the social order achieved in a market society, freed from capitalist domination, would ensure productive and mutual cooperation and live up to a reasonable ideal of social justice without coercive regulation by a state.
where other sections have demonstrated negatively that social and economic privileges often depend on background legal coercion and that removing legal coercion will undermine or eliminate unjust privilege, this section focuses on potential social problems within the market form and the positive means by which these problems might be addressed without the use of aggressive force. In Regulation Red Herring, Sheldon Richmond discusses the importance of spontaneous order as an organizing and harmonizing force in markets, and a natural form of market regulation based on mutual human relationships instead of political domination. In We Are Market Forces, Charles Johnson develops the same point and emphasizes the possibility not only of unplanned orders, but also of consensual social activism within freed markets. From the individualist's radical anti-capitalist perspective, the world of markets is much more extensive than the world of commercial transactions and incorporates all of the voluntary cooperative actions in which people can engage, including those designed to restrain or otherwise respond to nonviolent but morally objectionable conduct on the part of other people or organizations. In Platonic Productivity, Roderick Long considers the question of gender wage gaps, arguing that even in a fully freed market, sexist discrimination might continue to be a serious social and economic problem, one which conscious social activism could be needed to address. In Libertarianism and Anti-Racism, Sheldon Richmond encourages market anarchists to consider the nonviolent sit-in movement against segregated lunch counters in the American South as a historical model for precisely this sort of freed market social activism. Mary Ruart's Aggression and the Environment from her book Healing Our World and Charles Johnson's The Clean Water Act vs. Clean Water continue developing this theme by examining ways in which capitalist privilege, rather than free market profit motives, encourage environmental destruction and the anti-environmental ethic of limitless growth at all costs, and in which, in freed markets, community activists would be far freer to use market pressure and direct action to preserve the environment and heal the damage already inflicted by ecologically unsustainable corporate capitalism. In context-keeping and community organizing, Sheldon Richmond provides a strong defense and synthetic overview of the possibility of freed market grassroots social activism. The individualist anarchist tendency is alive and well, Markets, Not Capitalism, offers a window onto this tendency's history and highlights its potential contribution to the global anti-capitalist movement. We seek in this book to stimulate a thriving conversation among libertarians of all varieties, as well as those with other political commitments, about the most fruitful path toward human liberation. We are confident that individualist anarchist insights into the liberatory potential of markets without capitalism can enrich that conversation and we encourage you to join it. Gary Chartier, La Sierra University. Charles W. Johnson, Molinari Institute.